So amongst the equipment on bench 4A, in the back workshop that Mr. Chippy mainly uses, is this power supply. Uh, this is where we will in future be doing uh, bleed over tests is probably the best way to put it for selectivity. I just need to get to my um, ham radio project off here to, to do that. But we've got that power supply, I want you to know that power supply is there and on. It's a 3 amp power supply, in fact nearly all the power supplies here are 3 amp because um, the only time when we're doing 25 watt business radios and need a heftier power supply they're done on bench 2 which is the one with the overhead camera you normally see. Everything else is ne never going to be anything over 3 amps. So, um, that is set at 12 volts as you can see why it says 12.1. And it's also got two wires connected to the terminals, which are pretty low current wires, um, rated at about one amp. And so this is what we're talking about in a moment. That power supply is currently showing a current draw of 0.39, so that's 390 milliamps. So of course, just under half an amp. Now this room has just, we've had to take all the shelves out of here because we normally have a couple of steel shelves in the right hand corner. and really apart from Mr Chippy's walking boots and my um, Heath kit HW101 which we need to sort the transmit out on one I bought off eBay this room has just had all the windows replaced with double glazed units and this building was built in 1963 and it was really overdue for that to happen but of course it needs money doesn't it um, so we now have a room that is going to be um, a bit kinder in winter because there's no central heating here I'm in the middle of nowhere there's no gas so it has to be oil and that's very very expensive so we just use electric radiators uh, where and where necessary there are four air conditioners in this building and um, some of them are reverse cycle so they will heat as well so but I'll, I'm just going to swing the camera around and then you'll see this as tidy as you're ever going to see it so apart from uh, Mr. Chippy's walking boots, and he's away this weekend, um, so we can we can get up to things on his bench without him knowing. And the Mullard valve tester on its trolley, uh, you'll notice there is an air conditioner in this room, which is vital. And we've had that very hot period, and it's amazing that with the double glazed windows, it's made a huge difference on to how much our air conditioner is running. So we're going to go over to. Mr. Chippy's bench where we've set up an experiment. So what have we got on here? We've got an MFJ device and we're going to discuss this MFJ device right now. We've got two multimeters set up on it, an input and an output. The meter on the right is the one I normally use on bench two and the one on the left is actually the one that Mr. Chippy as available to him on this bench. So he does use his analog Japanese one, which is just lurking there. So, MFJ 4416C, the MFJ 4416C. Now, as you know, I've re uh, last year I bought an old van not too old to use though and I've been slowly kitting it out with radio equipment that's our ratchet van so we can have a ratchet jaw from that and you saw it on the GB2FLY video where we were doing some ham radio at an event and you've also seen it doing a test with Quotagius the Mallard So we wanted to test that the aerial that we were using on the van, which is the um, Antron 99 type of aerial, which we use a similar type. Hello. That's going to shut down, isn't it? Um, we use a similar type of aerial on the base setup when we do the range test from the workshop. And that's mounted, this is a, a single story building, so it's mounted just above gutter height. We, when we do these range tests, we're not trying to um, have some kind of elitist type of aerial with, at an elitist type of height. This is the kind of stuff we're doing is with ordinary things that anybody can replicate. 
But one of the problems we've got is that if we use the van, which we want to do some of the some good terrain range tests for walkie talkies, as, as it is, we're using our poor terrain test routes because between here and even I say the top of the hill, a hill in Lincolnshire is a bit of a slight incline. You know, it's not um, it, it's not like Yorkshire and, and and that, which is where I'm from. So when we go to the other side of that hill to Scratchy Corner, yeah, it's right in the bottom of a hill. Uh, and as far as Lincolnshire goes, it, it's pretty good. It's a good test. And we can tell when we're doing the same test time after time, what's good and what's bad. It's all right having the test instruments, but it's also useful to be able to see the difference and hear the difference on radios in actual use. Well, one of the dilemmas we've got is we can't always take a generator. I can't go into, really, I can't really go into a, oh, there's a nice lay-by on that road, and then get the van out and um, take a generator with us and, uh, you know, plug that in and start it up and make a noise and then put the mast up and put the GP, uh, not GPA 27, the um, Antron 99 up. You can't always do that. And so what we're going to do with the walkie-talkie test is we're simply going to have either a permanent mount or a mag mount. I don't know what we're doing yet. Uh, and we'll plonk on a nine-foot full quarter wave as a test aerial. And that makes it much fairer rather than something super-duper. Which brings me, the radio which is in there is, the, is one of the Harrius um, CBHQ bases. And... One of the problems is if we ran that off 12 volts and it has a 12 volt socket on the back, then the output is no longer going to be 4 watts. It's going to be nearer 2.5 watts. And a lot of you will know that certainly all the 1980s radios and a lot of the current radios, if you put them on 12 volts, they'll do a lot less power output on transmit than they will when they're at the full rail voltage of 13.8, which is to replicate a car with its engine running so it's charging the battery. So the thing was, what was I going to do? And I thought, well, we can use the LeisureVac battery that I've bought and installed in the van and then run an inverter, so we've got 240 volts, and then run a normal CB power supply, so we've got 13.8. But of course, it could introduce noise from the inverter. And that's something to experiment with. But I was talking on our GB3GR Wednesday night uh, 8 o'clock net, which we have every week, on 70 SEMS, to a fellow amateur who's um, quite elderly. I think he's in his 80s. And he still does have a motorhome. And I, I was kind of saying this to him. He says, well, I had an MFJ battery booster. And he says, and that gives you 13.8 volts from a 12-volt battery. Oh, I said. And so I looked on MFJ's website, and of course they know how to charge, don't they? But the stuff does work. And there we are with currently the MFJ 4416C, which we have right here. I was able to get this wholesale, but there's still a pretty penny. I think it was, you know, it was 200 quid. It wasn't free. And so the idea is that you run this on your leisure battery and by the time we've got this thin cable connected which I've deliberately used this thing's capable of 25 amps peak and so you're going to put cables on as thick as you're going to want to use now we're only going to be using this for the CB equipment but just in case we need to use it on some of the ham radio equipment uh, say up to 25 watts because we don't really do anything of over 25 watts um, I think we need to be able to put cable on which is going to be able to sink and source uh, 10 amps but we'll do that in the installation and this will be mounted discreetly away somewhere under the bench which I've put in there because you can run this by remote control and I'll come to that in a moment so, before I install it, I thought I'd do this little demonstration, because I've never seen one in my life. I'll try and put the meters in, rather than widen the shot, we'll try and put the meters into view. So that's our input meter. 
I've got a car light bulb here. It's a five amp, five amp. It's a five watt side light bulb, which we've soldered a wire on to keep it in its box so it doesn't dazzle me, the camera, and everything else. So we'll just widen the shutter fraction. So we've got 12, we're near enough 12 volts. We've got a slight loss on the on the lead, and we don't know. I mean, we buy these meters. That's quite an accurate meter. This Aldi or little one is the one we're using all the time, and you know it's absolutely fine. Um, I've got Avo eight, and they are the industry standard linear instrument, analog instrument in the UK. Um, and we use those sometimes when a service manual will say, with reference to an AVO8, that's when you need to get the AVO8 out, but it's cumbersome and it's inconvenient. And for most things, we can use digital multimeters. Somebody once tried to take the Michael out of me um, and said to me, oh, that, that's a $5 meter. So I actually went out and ordered off um, AliExpress a £2.89 meter and proceeded to use that because it makes no difference. I, you know, I, I don't, we're not setting up a, a spaceship and, it, and everything's got to be spot on. So yeah, the VCOs we do, they, they're important that they're right, but I trust the instrument and then they're right enough for what we're doing. So, we have got 11.6 volts coming out of this on load. When I press this button, lo and behold, it's supposed to be set for 13.8. We've now got 14 volts and of course that's fine. Our Nissan Leaf, which we use as a test car, the lead acid 12 volt battery charges at 14.4 in that car. And that's not unusual on modern cars. So that's fine. So our bulb's now brighter. If we go to take it off, it's dimmer. Let's just try and dazzle you a bit more. Brighter, put it back in its box. So we've still got 12 volts on the input. We've now got supposedly 13.8 on the output up to 25 amp peak. These days they don't give you an instruction book when you've paid your 200 quid or whatever they are. Uh, and you have to download it. And you can set this to cut out automatically. Um, it's set at 10 volts when it would deem the battery to be too flat to continue. But you can set that between 9 and 11 because it says so and it uh, has an audio alert. So 13.8 volts output for 9 to 13.8 volts input. So they also offer, and we've, we've ordered one of these, but it's not arrived yet, a remote control unit that sits on your bench, screws to the wall, whatever you're doing, and you've got input and output meters, and you've got the buttons which are down here on this unit, and it comes with a Cat5 cable to do that remote control work. So that is an accessory that is coming. It's quite a complex circuit diagram and you know I can understand why it's an expensive product. It isn't just a regulated chip in a so that's the printed circuit board layout and what the adjustments are and what the connections are. So this, these are available to download from MFJ's website. So that is going to give us the full rail voltage of 13.8. Oh, certainly on a half amp load, that's what um, we're getting out of it. And that means that our tests will be as we expect them to be with the radio working at the full 4 watts output. So that's what that's about, the MFJ 4416C and the MFJ 4416RC, the remote control. And we'll have that installed in the van when the remote control appears and uh, and then we'll be able to start doing some tests where we can just park up the van a bit more uh, inconspicuously than having a blooming great big generator and 
and an aerial on a on a mast. So that's what we're going to be doing. And in, in before we've done this, not with the van, but with a car with a nine foot type of um, aerial on it, we have. Uh, this is where we've had the fourteen mile range on the realistic TRC thousand and ones, um, and some of the other sets which we we're not going to get big range on in this area because it's a difficult terrain test, which is purposely chosen. If we went out towards Nottingham, uh, if I if I actually when we've done this with Mark, I sent him with half a dozen. And I think I'd sent him with 10 uh, different radios and uh, he knew what he'd taken and he wrote down the model numbers but he didn't tell me what they were. He went over to Nottingham, 35 miles away, sat on a peak, mapped top, um, and with a nine foot mag mount on one of our cars and he called me on the base station here on each one of those radios in turn, one of them we couldn't get two-way communication on, it didn't work well enough. In fact, that was actually a Midland 78, but I think it was malfunctioning rather than it being, it was an early Midland 78, uh, yeah, was an early one, PR2794. And um, there must have been a malfunction. And you know what, I wrote down how I, what I felt the clarity was of each of those radios. And I think the best one was in clarity, on transmit clarity, the best one was one of those, what you'd think was awful, um, JWRM 2s. And the next best one was an LCL economy. So all the expensive radios, and one of them was one of those £250 Albrecht remote split head, really state-of-the-art sets. And that was well down the list. So there you go. So there's some tests we will be replicating. But whilst Mr Chippy's away, I thought we'd commandeer his bench and put this on it. So I hope that's of interest because I've been doing this since 1979 and I didn't know a product like this existed until two weeks ago. Good old Alan. Thank you very much for that uh, input. And it's going to make our tests very much more valid when we get onto them. So thanks for watching the MFJ4416C battery booster discussion.